Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, so as you can see by the author's list, uh, this is a collaborative project involving a number of researchers from a variety of different government agencies. Um, I'm going to be really brief on the background here. Many of you uh, know in this room that the lake trout was once the uh, apex predator in the Great Lakes. It uh, supported a valuable commercial fishery until around the 1940s when the combined effect of overfishing and sea land predation caused the complete crash of most populations in the Great Lakes. A lot of effort has gone into restoring self-sustaining populations, including both the development of the sea lamprey control program, which uh, Chris described, as well as fairly consistent, uh, consistent stocking efforts since around the early 1970s. Despite all this effort, uh, recovery of lake trail populations across most of the Great Lakes has been rather slow. And there are a number of different possible explanations for this, including things like sea lamprey predation. Um, a new uh, kind of new theory is the uh, early mortality syndrome. Um, from thymine deficiency, as well as egg predation, things like that. Um, uh, but one other possibility is that low recruitment is a result of inappropriate spawning behaviors in hatchery raised fish. There are a number of, of uh, anecdotal observations that su suggest that hatchery raised fish may not be behaving normally during the spawning period, um, but the hypothesis has been difficult to test mainly because it's very difficult to study the behavior of these fish in the Great Lakes, and this has a lot to do with the uh, timing of the spawning migration, which is in the fall when conditions are rather ugly. In fact, most of what we know about uh, lake trout spawning comes either from commercial, uh, commercial fishermen or studies that are conducted in small inland lakes, and in fact the uh, behavior of wild lake trout in the Great Lakes has not yet been fully described. So that kind of uh, is where this study comes in. As I mentioned in the title, our study site is the Drummond Island Refuge, which is located on the south shore of Drummond Island in northern Lake Huron, highlighted here in orange. The uh, refuge was established in 1985, primarily as an experiment to uh, test the effects of sea lamp predation on lake trout populations, independent of um, fishing pressure. But since uh, around 2000, to 2004, there's been um, evidence of increased natural reproduction in the area, and uh, most recently I heard that the adult population estimate was about 50% wild now in this area. So this is great news for the lake trout, but also good news for us because it provides us with a rather unique opportunity to study the behavior of wild and hatchery raised lake trout in the same area. So that leads to the uh, purpose and objectives of the study. The purpose was to describe and compare the fall spawning behaviors of wild and hatchery lake trout. And our specific objectives are to uh, describe the physical and environmental characteristics that are associated with spawning behaviors, and then to compare whether the spawning behavior of wild and hatchery raised lake trout differ. Uh, this was also a three-year study, as was Chris's, uh, so data collection ended last fall. Um, and we're now kind of moving into the hardcore analysis phase and of course the paper writing. Um, in this study we use positional telemetry, um, so most of you probably know what that is, but if you don't, the idea is that uh, the system takes the difference in time it takes for the transmission to get from the tag to three different receivers to uh, triangulate a position for that fish. In our case the, uh, the position seemed to be uh, estimated with an accuracy of uh, about 10 meters of the true location of the fish. Uh, this is an image of the array. Um, so it's right along the shore of uh, Drummond Island. It uh, changed a little bit from year to year, but it covered mainly the same area. We expanded it in 2011 and then decided not to do that again in 2012. <laughs> On average, we used 140 receivers and it covered an area that was at least 25 square kilometers, so a rather big array. You can see from the image here, we also had really uh, fine bathymetry data, which was collected for us by Nigel Watrous. The resolution of that was one square uh, meter. We measured environmental characteristics while we were there uh, using mainly this uh, Titus 900 weather buoy. It measured seven different parameters, including wind, speed, and direction, and wave um, height and direction, which were the ones we were primarily interested in. It also measured temperature and uh, barometric pressure. Uh, we scattered temperature loggers throughout so that we could get an idea of the vertical temperature profile in the lake. 
And then last fall, we started working with Jay Austin from the University of Minnesota Duluth on a process uh, driven current model. So we could test specific hypotheses about how the, the uh, lake trout are responding to local currents. That's something that's in process. So uh, hopefully we will hear something soon from that. <coughs> um, in terms of tagging, we tagged a total of 400 lake trout uh, in 2011 and 2010. We split the tags as equally as we could between the four treatment groups, the so wild and hatchery, males and females. And half of the tags had pressure sensors in them, which uh, provided information about the uh, swimming depths of the fish. And these tags had a battery life of about five years, which meant that when fish returned year after year to the uh, site, we got additional information for them. Um, we, we collected a ton of data uh, with this. I think I saw 56 million detections was total. 18 million of those were for the fish for Grumman Island. Um, we also collected more than a million actual fish positions describing the behavior of, I think, 358 different fish. So we collected a ton of data. Just managing the data has been a bit of a challenge. Um, but probably the biggest impediment to the uh, analysis so far is the fact that when we started this, we didn't know where or even if the fish were spawning here. Uh, the survey suggested they were spawning somewhere in this area, but we didn't actually know where. So a lot of our effort over the last few years is just trying to figure out where exactly are these fish spawning. Uh, this is the way we uh, approach this. We figured that the easiest way was to look at the telemetry data and look for areas of aggregation. We did this by uh, dividing the entire array into 20 square meter grids and then color coding the grids based on the proportion of individuals that were detected there. And you can see when you do this, this is uh, specific for wild males, I think in 2010, certain areas show up as being highly used while others don't. And that's all fine and good. It looks like those could be spawning sites, but you really don't know based on the telemetry data. These could be staging sites or possibly just bottlenecks in, in migration. So we had to actually go down and verify that egg deposition was occurring there. We did this with diver surveys. Um, so basically, we, were, we dove a number of the sites that we identified as potential spawning sites, and we were looking, oops. And uh, hopefully you can see them here. We were looking for the eggs. So we dove digging in the rocks looking for eggs. Uh, in total, we have identified to date six distinct spawning sites. Um, often, we saw large groups of fish, which was nice because it helped us to um, locate the, where the eggs would be. Uh, the thing that was most uh, interesting to me and, and sort of the most was how widely the habitat character sort of ranged among the six spawning sites. So I'm just going to take some time here to describe these sites and kind of identify some of the, the things that were common and also some of the things that were uh, different. Uh, so in 2011, we identified three spite sites. Two of them were on this reef called Horseshoe Reef. Both were at the northern tips. And these sites conformed uh, closely to kind of the accepted and traditional view of lake trout habitat spawning, um, or spawning habitat, sorry. Both were located uh, adjacent to, to steep slopes. They were uh, composed mainly of cobble from five to, to about 30 centimeters. Um, these were both fairly shallow sites, only in about three to four meters of water. Um, well, I should mention that this is a bar here. You'll see this bar over and over again. That's a 20 centimeter bar. Um, and the areas where we found the highest density of the eggs tended to be clean. We did find some eggs, however, in some of these other areas that were algae covered. Um, so that's kind of the, the traditional model, and, and that's what Horseshoe Reef kind of fits that model. The third site we found in 2011 was quite a bit different. Um, this was named Binder Reef, and not by me. Um, the, the substrate was a little bit smaller, but again, it was cobble. The thing that was mainly different here was the topography was completely flat. There's a slight incline, but it's a very flat area. And the places we were finding eggs were just these 10 to 15 meter diameter clear areas on this flat space. So this was not where we thought we would find eggs. Um, so a little bit different. As we move into 2012, the sites got a little bit even more divergent from the traditional uh, spawning habitat. Uh, the first site was called Big Shoal, and it was largely just a big sheet of bedrock with these little piles of pitted limestone that was completely covered with algae. 
so it wasn't clean and it was on this flat bedrock area. And there were a number of different piles of rocks. Um, if you lifted up that top layer though, uh, underneath was clean uh, substrate with nice interstitial spaces, so uh, potentially good uh, um, incubation habitat. Also the substrate here was a lot larger than at the other sites that we found in 2011. Um, our deepest site that we found so far is we call Deep Reef and it's a reef in about 90 feet or 30 meters of water. Uh, the eggs that we found were on the peak of the reef in about 15 meters of water. The substrate size was very similar to Big Shoal but again it was really dirty and this one was actually just littered with uh, some sort of dracaenid, either zebra mussels or quaggas, I'm not sure how to tell the difference so I think Ellen Marsden told me they were quaggas but um, again, when you lifted that up, it was a clean pitted limestone underneath. Um, this one conformed a little bit more to the uh, topography of Horseshoe Reef. We found eggs along the entire um, ridge here, but they were highly localized on the north side where there was a maybe a six foot incline, um, so kind of steep area. So there was a bit of a, of a uh, topography there. Uh, the third site that we found in 2012 is probably our most unique site. We actually looked at the site in 2011 based on the telemetry data, but we abandoned it because when we went down, we saw it was largely just this uh, rocky area that was completely infilled with sand and these huge like car-sized boulders. And it wasn't until 2012 when we were doing some uh, drop camera work from our boat, we actually saw fish swimming out from under these boulders and we thought, well, let's go check it out. And what we found is that the fish were spawning in these tiny gravel, gravel piles at the base of these boulders. Quite often, actually, they were underneath. There were little caves under there and they were spawning under there. So not at all where you would expect to find lake trout spawning. So you can see we're finding eggs in a lot of different places and this kind of brings up the question, is this representative of aberrant behavior in the lake trout? or possibly is it evidence of some sort of bias in our understanding of lake trout spawning behavior because we've never looked for eggs where we don't expect to find them. This was probably a good case where we just said, oh, no way, and moved on. Um, so this is something that we're interested in. Uh, why are they spawning at some of these sites? What's common amongst these sites that would attract lake trout there? And that's something that we're going to be working on in the future. Nonetheless, now that we know where the lake trout are spawning, uh, we can now start to interpret the telemetry data as spawning behavior. Um, it was fortunate this year that I, uh, because the meeting was a bit later, I was able to get the 2012 data back from Vemco in time to look at it for this meeting. So most of the results I present are for, from 2012, um, but all of the trends I'm presenting are things that I've seen consistently across the three years. Um, just going to introduce some abbreviations because you can see them over and over again. Um, in terms of the sites, HSR is Horseshoe Reef. Um, I pooled the two sites together because I found that if they went to one arm of Horseshoe Reef, they almost certainly went to the other arm of Horseshoe Reef. Um, BDR is Binder Reef, so that the other area that we found in 2011, Big Shoal down here is that uh, bedrock area. Deep Reef is our deep site and Thompson Alley or THA is our big boulder place. Um, and as you might expect, F is female, M is male, W is uh, wild and H is hatchery. So when you see MW, that means uh, male wild. Um, so starting kind of at the beginning of the process, movement onto these shallow water reef areas from the deep water. There are a number of different ways that we've looked at this. Uh, the data I decided to present here is from the depth tags. Uh, what you're looking at on the bottom graph is the swimming depths, the average swimming depth of the fish for each group versus date. And I use this color uh, scheme consistently with the blue and green being males and the red and orange being females. We, I've also added onto this graph the temperature from one of the loggers at 10 uh, meters depth. And as we expected, we see that the fish tend to move onto the reefs and consistently stay up there in these shallow water areas the, the, around the middle of October. And this is what uh, we thought was happening. Um, but the thing that should be obvious is that there's a big difference between the males and females. 
The males are moving into these kind of average 10 meter depths. The females are tending to reside at much deeper depths and making only periodic forays into these really shallow areas. So a lot more uh, variability here where the males seem to be moving into these shallow wa water areas and staying there. <clears throat> the other interesting thing that happened in 2012 was this early peak of movement into the uh, shallow water zone. Um, and it occurred only for a couple days and then they got pushed back into the deep water. And it was kind of interesting because this allowed us to look at some of these environmental characteristics we've been monitoring and try to figure out if it's correlated with that. And it turns out <coughs> indeed that both of these kind of uh, big scale movements into the shallow water corresponded with the rapid decrease in water temperature that occurs when the lake turns over. And usually this is associated with storm events. So we know that at least, the, uh, at least there's a correlation between these movements onto the spawning reef and, uh, and temperature. Um, moving on now to looking at the individual reefs themselves and, and trying to identify which of these reefs are being used by which fish. Um, just a brief summary here. This is the number of fish that were positioned on each of the five uh, spawning areas. When you look at the data, uh, there's a lot there, but um, when, when you look between the groups in terms of proportional wise, there isn't a huge difference between wild and hatchery fish and there isn't, the wild fish aren't preferring this site and the hatchery fish are preferring that site. What is noticeable though is that two sites in particular, Horseshoe Reef and Thompson Alley, there are a lot more lake trout uh, detected at those sites than at the other three sites. This of course suggests that those two sites are more popular than the others. The other interesting thing that came out of this analysis though was that we also noticed that lake trout were using multiple sites. This graph here shows the treatment group versus the portion of individuals that were located at one, two, three, four, or five spawning sites. You can see that 75% or, or more fish uh, were positioned at two or more sites, and between 40 and 65% were positioned at three or more sites, and there were a few that went to all five sites. So it's pretty clear that the fish are moving around, visiting different sites. And that, of course, brings up the question, how much time are they spending on each of these sites? And that's what this graph is showing. Um, for this, I broke the entire study period into one hour intervals and counted the number of one hour intervals that the fish were uh, located on each of the sites. So you've got your sites, your treatment groups, and your number of uh, one hour intervals. And this graph shows us something different than the previous graph did. If you remember, the previous graph suggested Horseshoe Reef and Thompson Alley might uh, be equal in terms of popularity. This graph clearly shows that Horseshoe Reef is far more popular. In fact, at least seven times more popular than the other sites. Um, so even though the same number of fish are going to the two sites, they're spending a lot more time at Horseshoe Reef. The other thing uh, that's noticeable here, especially when you look at the Horseshoe Reef data, is that the females, like, like the uh, depth data suggested, are spending less time on the reefs, especially if you look here at the wild female. So these are box plots. This line represents the median, and this is the uh, interquartile range. <coughs> the other thing, though, that was really interesting is there's a huge amount of variation. 431 hour intervals is the equivalent of about 18 days that, that some of these fish are spending on this reef, while others are only spending a couple hours. And that variation is kind of interesting, and uh, that's something that I'm interested in pursuing more, both in terms of what are the animals that spend a small amount of time here, what are they doing at these other sites, and also if there's a relationship between some of the other characteristics that we've measured, like fish length as an indication of age, maybe. Maybe younger fish are choosing the less popular sites because they're getting pushed out or something like that. So that's something that I'm going to uh, investigate further. Um, so that's kind of all I have for results right now. Uh, just kind of summarize some of the main conclusions that we, that we can make so far that, with this data. Um, both with the data I present today and other analyses that I've done suggest that uh, we've got a mating system that surrounds males aggregating on the spawning sites uh, for sometimes extended periods of time, with females tending to reside in deeper water and then moving onto the spawning grounds just for small, short amount of times. Um, just to spawn. Um, we know that movement into shallow water reefs occurs in October and seems to be correlated with decreasing 
temperatures, although as I mentioned, we do have other environmental characteristics, so we can't say it's a cause of a relationship at this point. We need to look at some of these other relationships and look for correlations and all that kind of stuff. But it's at least a, a strong correlation that was consistent across the years. Uh, we've discovered that lake trout will spawn on a variety of different substrate types, including many that do not fit the current lake trout uh, spawning habitat model. So we may have an opportunity here to kind of expand our understanding of what makes good habitat for lake trout spawning. And that obviously has important um, implications for recovery of lake trout. <coughs> um, and lastly here, we know that lake trout will visit numerous spawning sites, but some spawning sites are clearly better than others. And uh, one of the things I'll talk about in a couple slides is that we need to understand what makes one site better than the other. So in terms of the overarching question though, which was the title of my talk about the differences between wild and hatchery, I think it's too early to say. Um, some of the analyses that I've done suggest that there are differences, some suggest there aren't. Sometimes there is in one year and not the other. Um, most of the analysis I've done so far is kind of superficial if you want to say, you know, we're scratching the surface here. I think if there are differences, they're probably more subtle and we won't really start to see any true differences that they exist until we really get in there and look at what that fish is doing, that fish is doing, etc. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that <laughs> at this point and say that maybe next year when Glover comes around, I'll have an answer for you on that. Um, in terms of what next, as Chuck mentioned, we need to write some papers. So this year is going to be spent a lot on analyzing this data and writing papers. But we're also starting a new project up at Drummond Island. Uh, this work is actually going to be done by a master's student largely. And we're going to take a more experimental approach. Uh, we're going to use the telemetry that we've collected so far and the information that we've gathered to classify different habitats as either being um, confirmed as used for spawning, confirmed as not used for spawning, or not visited by lake trout. And then we'll uh, compare the incubation quality of those sites uh, using, experimentally using uh, egg incubators. And the question here basically is, are lake trout choosing the best available sites to re reproduce? Um, we also last year started a much smaller scale telemetry study in Thunder Bay on lake trout. And this is a collaboration with the University of Vermont, uh, Michigan DNR, and NOAA. Uh, last year we deployed a two th uh, 24 sorry, receiver positional array and we tagged 40 fish. And the questions here are um, centered around understanding the differences in behavior at a natural reef area and these two artificial reef areas that were constructed to help restoration efforts, and also uh, testing hypotheses surrounding chemical cues and how they might be used to attract uh, lake trout to spawning reefs. And then the last thing I want to share with you here, uh, through this telemetry, we're able to learn a lot about lake trout behavior, but there's just some things that you can only learn by actually seeing the animals. Um, so we were fortunate enough to get what we're fairly certain is the first video of lake trout spawning in the Great Lakes. So I thought I'd share a brief clip. We collected many, many hours of video and I think this is probably the best clip. That we, oops. Hmm, yeah, I was say, I don't know how to. So we're fortunate, this is actually some daytime spawning, which uh, it's thought that lake trout spawn almost exclusively at night. So this is possibly a rare event. a little group there. The one in the in the center is the female. Away now. <laughs> there we go. So I'll just end by thanking there was a lot of people involved in this project, a lot of people, especially the people working in the field in terrible conditions, snow, ice sometimes, to make this project a success. So I'd like to especially acknowledge the field crew some of them are in this room. Matt, I think, can tell you he had a great time last year. Um, and if there's time, I'll take any questions.